Good morning, everyone. Do I press things? Oh, there we go. Okay, let's go back. If I look a little disheveled, uh, it's because I forgot what it meant to look for a cab in New York City when it rains. <laughs> so I'm still actually wet from the knees down. Um, so, so as Courtney said, uh, I spent quite a lot of time in financial services, big companies, uh, before Chef. The smallest company I worked for had 40,000 people in it. The last company I worked for had 300,000 people in it. So as Courtney said, it's a little different. Um, but exactly how is it different? Now, Courtney said that I'm going to talk about some of the ideas that we used in driving some of the change in GE Capital, which is where I was last. So one of the things about joining Chef and one of the things about being kind of dropped into this completely different environment, this awesome environment, the totally different culture, a totally different dynamic, is you kind of change your mind. So what she said, I'm not going to do anymore. Uh, <laughs> this is when Courtney's radioing at the back, saying, cut the sound, cut the sound. So um, I'd like to talk about control, and I'd like to talk about two different kinds of control. One is control in the form of compliance and how large companies think about compliance. So we're still going to do that. That's kind of enterprisey. But I'm also going to talk about control of this industry. So it's just been an amazing five months working at Chef and working with a whole bunch of different partners that we have, also competitors, customers. And I've had, I think, an interesting insight into control and what the nature of control is and some of the challenges that we have to overcome as an industry when we think about control. So, I think this is just one of the most inspiring quotes I've read. So it's by Stafford Beer. He's the father, if you like, of management cybernetics. And there's developing in our DevOps community a little bit of a subculture around cybernetics. Uh, I know Jeff Sussner's uh, presenting later um, at the conference, and he's also into it. So cybernetics is beginning to emerge as kind of a lingua franca, if you like, looking backwards to try and find some ideas that help us understand what the philosophical underpinnings are, if you like, of, of DevOps. And of course, what cybernetics is all about is control and feedback, particularly feedback. And at its very core, DevOps is about the efficiency of feedback. So if you look at the diagram and you consider that you have the environment, operations, that's us, people that do things, and management, that's what I used to do. <laughs> um, you'll see the little diagrams with the triangles that look like diodes and the little squiggly lines that look like resistors. And essentially, this is the highest level cybernetic view of an organization from a management point of view. So the triangles refer to an amplification of intention where management is basically saying, this is what our strategy is, we want to do this. And then as a response from operations, there's kind of an attenuation, what's called an attenuation, to the extent that what it is, is management only understands so much about what it's being told, right? And also, management cannot Res respond to absolutely every single feedback that it gets, otherwise it would be continually acting. And so here we get the first myth of control. The first myth of control is, in order for management to effectively apply a policy deep into an organization, what they have to do is they have to minimize their understanding of what they're getting back, the responses they're getting back, which is why large enterprises typically go into an exercise of box ticking and fairly arbitrary approaches to understanding, have we really complied with the outcome? So how many times have you ever been in a conversation with compliance people and you say, well, we're doing what you want, right? Your outcome is the security of X or the separation of duties of Y or we have complete transparency in the dev process, therefore you don't have to worry about someone putting in rogue code. But they're not interested in the outcome. What they're interested in is they're interested in some, something, some little indication that allows them to tick a box. And the reason for that really comes back to this process of attenuation, where it's impossible to have as much variety as there is in operations sitting in the management space. 
and so therefore they have to simplify it. Now, ironically, DevOps is literally, and I think this is why it's such a revolution, DevOps is literally something that enables us to respond to this challenge. Because something really counterintuitive happens. And that is, if you do have these feedback loops that are kind of slow and dumbing down the process of updating, what if you could make those feedback loops really quick, really fast? And so in the process of being very, very fast and constantly updating, not only your implementation of something, but also people's understanding of what they're seeing as, as part of that process of, of, of looking at the results of your uh, implementation of compliance or whatever it happens to be. What if we were able to do that incredibly quickly? And of course, this is what happens in agile projects where you have compliance people as core parts of the projects themselves. And that works incredibly quickly. And it also starts to plug into this idea that you get from the Stafford Beer quote, which is around freedom. Because now what happens is, is people start having the ability to be able to make decisions within a more limited context within the organizations or the teams or the sprints that they're working within. And that means that the quality of information that ultimately gets back to management requires less attenuation because it's talking about something else. It's not talking about the box. It's not talking about the, the ticking of it. It's talking about the qualitativeness of the outcome. Now, what sits at the core of this idea is you know, whenever there is a communication from you know, one world to another world, so operations to management, if you like, there's this translation process. And this in cybernetics is referred to as transduction. And so whenever there's transduction, for anyone who's worked on error codes and things like that, you know, there's often, there's, it's, it's usually not lossless. And so there's a certain amount that is lost in that translation as you translate from one language into another language. Now, again, DevOps has something really interesting to say in this space, and that is infrastructure as code. Now, infrastructure as code, it turns out, is really a specification of what you want to be implemented. And as the specification languages become richer, such as, for instance, in tools like Chef, you're able to specify what those things are in a declarative way that is clear, clear enough and understandable enough by people other than just the people who are writing the code. So now what happens is, is infrastructure as code becomes a lingua franca, if you like, for understanding how we are implementing, or rather how we are applying policy to that small domain of infrastructure. And so infrastructure as code and the process of constantly iterating and testing infrastructure as part of a continuous delivery process begins to actually develop an improved understanding and an improved attainment of compliance within large organizations. And we've definitely seen this work. And the idea that you can always say, and I'm sure you've all been in the situation, to a security person at an organization that you're working with as a client or, or as an employee, can you specify exactly what you want? I mean, how many of us have seen 500-page security documents that are vague and unimplementable? Right? Hands up. Come on, please. Yes? Okay. Five. You guys are doing well. So, so the basic idea is, is that the use of this common language is really important. So the myth of control is just by virtue of specifying a policy at a management level and trying to apply it as part of this process of amplification onto the operations organization doesn't work. Ironically, though, the responsibility sits with us. The responsibility sits with us to find a way of showing results and creating involvement so that the freedom that the organization sees is also the freedom of those who they've put in the position of evaluating how effective and how compliant we are, so compliance people, et cetera. So involve them early in your projects, involve them frequently. Uh, they don't have to understand absolutely everything that they're seeing or, or, or reading. Uh, but, and for those that were at the CHEF conference this year, as long as they see how the sausage is made, you know, how the whale sausage is made, um, that gets you a long way. So, 
So that's this first idea of control in large organizations. So the idea, though, is that we can have better compliance at velocity with minimal transduction if we use some basic language that enables us to translate compliance, uh, compliance of infrastructure into code. That's a basic idea. But here's the problem. We're not actually in control of this revolution. So this revolution, that, and we're, we're talking about all of this stuff, and wonderful thing about web, web conferences is we all agree with each other, right? Who doesn't think DevOps is awesome, right? Uh, who doesn't think that we've got all the stuff that we need to solve all of these problems? The fact of the matter is, is that unfortunately, a very small percentage of the Fortune 500 are web companies. A large percentage of them are kind of immigrants into this world that we are representing here. I mean, how many people here work for a company that's either not a web company or has more than, I don't know, 5,000 people? Anyone? Not a lot of people. So who are we talking to? So Gordon Moore put, put this classic model of, of innovation diffusion forward. And we know that innovators, you always find an innovator, right? I mean, some people just have to have the first iWatch, right? And others will wait longer. But this organizational idea also applies to how people are beginning to implement some of these DevOps ideas, including this crazy idea about having compliance people involved in you know, DevOps projects and things like that. So you will find in some organizations, there will be particularly uh, in the web part of that company often, there'll be a little team that's working on this stuff and they're trying this stuff out, they're on the innovators. But what about the rest? Because here's the bad news. If you don't get the pragmatists in that organization to start adopting this stuff, we lag behind. Because the fact is, is that a large part of the economy, the largest part of the economy, and as our technology begins to saturate the web world that we're in, a large part of our growth in revenue ultimately comes from these enterprises. And so if you have a look at this diagram, this is a, a concept that we use called the operating chasm. If you imagine that on the left-hand side, that graph that's going downwards is this tapering off of the amount of legacy, all of the complex crap and slow stuff, let's say, and you want to ramp that down over time and you want to, over time, increase the penetration in your organization of more advanced stuff, whatever that happens to be, that little blue area, that blue area is called the operating chasm. Now, that blue area represents what happens when an organization has done more than a few of these little things, more than a few projects where these kinds of ideas are being implemented. And the organization starts to fight back. Now, that graph is what it looks like for a web company, for you guys. Operating chasm is pretty small. This is what it looks like for a large enterprise. Now, if you want practical examples of what this looks like, when you're starting to talk about processes and approaches to thinking about compliance, DevOps, high-velocity development, where does ITIL fit in? Because I've been in an organization where ITIL is represented by 300 people. How do we think about distributed authentication across the organization? Now, once you've done a couple of projects, and we're so good as an industry about congratulating ourselves that we've done a couple of projects in all of these big organizations, but you know what? Doing one or two projects in a large organization of 300 people doesn't amount to a hill of beans. If we want to drive this revolution and start fundamentally changing the operating model of IT, we have to start, if you like, selling to the pragmatists. And it's selling to the people that are in the chasm. And so I think one of the key ideas that we have to start thinking about is we need to start innovating how enterprises adopt. It's so easy for us to be thinking about new features in the tools and the processes. We spend a lot of time talking about how we run projects. We spend a lot of time talking to some really, and Chef has recently hired Jez Humble. Yes. What? Yep. How awesome is that? There we go. 
So we spend a lot of time hiring awesome people who know about how to run projects and can really help organizations. But I think as product companies, we all have to start thinking about what innovation looks like in driving adoption within large enterprises. Because we don't control the revolution. It feels like we do because we all hang out together. But we don't. And in some ways, coming from that world, I think that large enterprises probably reach out to us more than we reach out to them, except in a pure sales mode. So we need to, as an industry, start thinking about how we innovate more effectively around how we enable enterprises to adopt new technologies. Um, and so I suppose the hashtag is, you know, those who control the chasm, this kind of operating chasm, those of us that can really help organizations broach it, they will really control the revolution. Thanks very much.